So we are really, really grateful and delighted that Gerard has come today. Just so you know who he is, I have his bio on my, um, my phone. I'm just going to read some of it so you know how smart he is. Um, so <laughs> Not that you're embarrassed. So he received a BA in biochemistry from Oxford. Um, and then he spent a lot of time in the US um, at the University of California. And he was appointed as a distinguished professor of cancer biology at the University of California. Um, and then came back in 2009 to the University of Cambridge, where he's in the Department of Biochemistry. Um, so he is going to talk to us a little bit today about about cancer and about what the research world looks like. So take it away. Um, so I never know quite what I'm going to talk about. Um, and partly that's because it's somewhat up to you. So if I'm dawdling along some particular line and people are at the back going, oh, then I'll probably just uh, switch gears and try and do something a little bit more interesting. Uh, but I thought generally what I would do is I. I First of all, I want to thank you for the amazing invitation to come here. I mean, it, for people like me, who spend our life in laboratories um, and who chose not to be medics and therefore are, shall we say, cut off from the people that we try to help, um, it's a, an amazing privilege and a huge opportunity for me to actually be able to meet you and talk to you. So I, I, I really am uh, enormously grateful to you for the invitation. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself, not because I'm a you know, mega ego, but it just might give you a better idea about you know, where this guy's coming from and um, you know, why I'm interested in cancer and this particular disease or set of diseases. I thought then I'd tell you a little bit about our contemporary understanding of what cancers are. Now, many of you presumably are all razor sharp and smart, and you probably know all of this stuff probably more than me. I mean, I, I have to teach it, but, you know, you, you're probably at least as well up as I am. But nonetheless, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavor of it. And then I thought I'd end by telling you um, that we're in an incredibly exciting time um, and where it's going and what I think the outcome will be, which is a very good outcome. Um, I don't know when. Uh, I don't know how quickly, and of course that's relevant to people in this room, uh, but the outcome will be a good outcome at some point uh, in the foreseeable future. So I've um, I spent my life uh, trying to understand cancer. Now, you might think, well, why? Well, actually, before I knew what cancer was, I wanted to be a cancer researcher. And the reason is, it sounds a bit strange, so I, I was about eight years old, and I was already a sort of science geek, but I, I was quite interested in dinosaurs. And then I went to see a movie called Fantastic Voyage, which is about people being miniaturized and injected in a small submarine into somebody's, yeah, yeah. It's got Raquel Welch in it, which, <laughs> because I was only eight at the time, it was a complete matter of disinterest to me. Um, though the bit where she's covered with antibodies, which, inc which incidentally have the wrong structure, but still, <laughs> it's neither here nor there. I, I, so I came out of that, I thought, oh, this is so cool, biology, red blood cells going from blue to red and wobbling around and people being eaten by macrophages and all sorts of, I thought this is just so, so cool. And it turned out, you know, my mum died when I was quite young and my dad remarried and my stepmom worked in a cancer research lab uh, and up in London somewhere. I lived in the sort of east end of London and up in London... Actually, I grew up with this notion that Walthamstow was about a thousand miles from St. Paul's, and you could only get there through a tunnel. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't realize we were actually pretty close together, but anyway. So, um, and, uh, you know, so this is this thing called cancer research. And uh, in those days, uh, there used to be um, people who would come around and knock on the doors, and they would collect money for cancer research, or generic cancer research. I don't know which cancer charity it was or whatever else. And so there was this notion that grew in my head, which was this was something that people really are very worried about, they're very concerned about, and it's some sort of disease. And so I decided, merely because it was the sort of thing that people seemed to be very concerned about and, and worried about, that it would be something that was very interesting. And so that set my interest. So you know, what I mean is, before I knew what cancer was, I wanted to be a cancer researcher. So um, I did a degree in biochemistry, uh, in Oxford, as you heard, and that was because I was very interested in how biological systems work. And biological systems are, are incredibly beautiful um, and 
almost all the time they work very, very well. And they work very, very well not because they're finely tuned, but because they're incredibly sloppy and noisy, but they've, through the process of evolution, had the ability to slop off into disasters pruned away. So the idea of biology that you can sometimes get nowadays is it's all you know, tightly controlled gears and levers and everything. It's not like that at all. It's complete noise. And because biological systems evolve, there's lots of ransacking of old systems, rummaging around in the evolutionary attic and redeploying things in strange ways because it happens to be a shape that sort of works there, sort of works. So how sort of work does it have to? And you have to remember this. It has to sort of work well enough to enable the majority of that species to get to reproductive age, because that's how evolution works, okay? And uh, anything after reproductive age, you're on your own, because there's been, <laughs> there's been no, seriously, there's been no selection to optimize, uh, no serious selection to optimize beyond reproductive age. And something else comes out of this understanding of biology as well, which is anything that makes it better for you to get to reproductive age at the cost of at some point later in time, uh, causing you problems. Or anything that uh, enhances the majority's uh, ability to get reproductive age at the cost of accidents that might uh, affect a few will tend to get selected for positively. So the most glaring example of this is that when you cut your finger, you have this amazing ability to repair the damage. Right? And when you cut your finger, you know, incredible things happen. Many, many different types of cells communicate one with the other, and they rebuild tissues and blood vessels, and they invade, and they do all the things that cancers do. The only difference really being that they stop when the job is done. And cancers don't stop, or at least they don't stop well enough to prevent the continued expansion of cells. And so um, the, the thing that's interesting about cancer is it involves processes that happen all day, every day, in every human being. And that was the thing that fascinated me. So after I did this degree in biochemistry, which I have to say, it's like any degree, you know, it's four years of hell. <laughs> I thought, oh, God, I can't do this anymore. Maybe I'd be a psychologist or something. You know. I went, um, I, I left Oxford, and I decided I needed a complete change, so I ended up in Cambridge. Can you believe it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, which is smaller and less pretty, but no. no, no. Um, and um, the great hope in those days, and this was way back before anybody in this room was born, I'm sure, was immunology. That is, um, trying to understand how we defend ourselves against interlopers and infectious agents, but also against cancers. And the idea was the immune system has this ability to spot what's normal and what's unusual, and uh, it, it targets what's unusual and clamps down and removes it, and this was probably keeping cancers at bay. And this was, as I say, back in the late 70s and the early 80s, and um, it became very quickly clear in the course of my PhD not due to any work that I was doing, but just because of the way that the world was moving, that this wasn't what was happening. The immune system didn't seem to know what was a cancer and what was a normal. It didn't seem to play much of a role. And so my PhD, I finished, I thought, ah, done with immunology, and I went off to California to learn about the molecular biology of cancer. Meanwhile, of course, as many of you may be aware, what has happened is in the last uh, five to six years, there's been a complete revolution in our understanding of the immune system. We now understand that the immune system plays a very, very important role, or at least can be enlisted to play a very, very important role in the treatment of patients with cancer. Mm -hmm. So things go round and round and round, and this is what the wonder of science, which is what is dogma one minute is knocked down and becomes a, you know, a huge open question. And the great thing about scientists, which I like, is that though a few of them stick with the dogma long after it's clear the dogma no longer works, uh, the usual response is to say, huh, great. More to discover, more to find out, and more opportunities to treat patients and develop therapies for patients. So I went to California as a postdoctoral fellow, again working in cancer, trying to understand the molecular biology of cancer. Um, and then I came back uh, to the UK and I worked for a time at what was called the Imperial Cancer Research Fund. You know it's in Britain because it starts with Imperial. <laughs> um, which was um, a, uh, one of the cancer charities that's now merged with Cancer Research Campaign to form Cancer Research UK. And they had this big laboratory um, in London 
where um, I first heard about cancer because my mum worked up in London in a cancer research institute. So there was a sort of intriguing closure that was by no means planned, but it's a nice story. So, I mean, okay. um, and then um, after a period there, I moved to the University of California in San Francisco because everybody wants to live in California for a bit, um, <laughs> except people on the east coast of America who go, oh, God, I never want to go there. All that sun and ugh, you know, stuff like that. And that was great. And what that did for me was um, th there's great intellectual life in the United Kingdom, a remarkable intellectual life, and it's very, very um, healthy. Um, what they have in the US, which we don't have so much of in the UK, is a sense of urgency. And people really want to get stuff done in the US. And it was a great lesson for me to learn that it's all very well sitting around coming up with clever ideas. But at the end of the day, there's people hanging, hanging around out there waiting for people like me, hopefully, to come up with clever ideas to help treat people like you. Know, you. And uh, this sense of urgency, uh, I think, was a very, very important lesson for me to learn. So I then, um, having been in California for 12 years, moved back to Cambridge, um, where there is, shall we say, not that great sense of urgency a lot of the time. There's an awful lot of people still sitting around being very clever and saying, pass the wine and stuff like that and everything else. Um, and so what I've been trying to do since then is uh, introduce that sense of urgency, uh, that we're in a hurry, and we are in a hurry. Now, why we, are we in a hurry? We're in a hurry because for the first time in my life, and we're talking, I started in 1977, so we're talking 40 years. My God, that's a bit of a shock. For the first time in my life, it's clear that we will be able to treat the majority of cancers in the foreseeable future now. I can't give you a date or I can't tell you when, but I want to describe to you why we think that. And, um, and I want to share with you that sort of feeling of a tremendous human accomplishment that people have had. You know, there, there are the two most important virtues in life, but in science in particular, are trust and courage. So we need the people who fund our research to trust us to do the best job that we can and be creative and come up with out-of-the-box ideas and new ways of thinking about it. And in order to meet that trust, we have to have courage, which means that we've got to be prepared to think outside the box, sometimes at risk of the breaking dogma and upsetting our friends and our colleagues and various other things. So thinking about different things in different ways. And these two, trust and courage, intermingle. And uh, they're quite hard because, as you know, once you've built your career in something and you're looking towards the end of your career and your retirement and whatever else like that, people tend to veer away from doing the risky weirdo things. There's also a tendency for some people to do risky weirdo things just because they're risky and weirdo. <laughs> okay. So as I always say, you've got to be uh, courageous but not reckless. You've got to be tenacious but not stubborn. And you've got to be intellectual, but you've got to be pragmatic, which is the end of the day. It doesn't matter how much you think about it and how clever you are. If it doesn't deliver at the end, it's really not going to matter that much to so many people. So that's where I'm coming from, uh, a lifetime in cancer research. Um, and uh, an opportunity like this is, is very precious and very important. So what do we understand about cancer now? So cancer is usually depicted as some thing that's growing you know, and that you, inside you. It comes from nowhere. It's all very medieval. You know, there's no warning. This is why it's so scary and so frightening. Um, and uh, it, it's never or not often properly explained what is going on. And essentially what's going on is that there are perfectly normal processes uh, in our bodies for either building tissues during the development of the human being, the embryo, or of repairing tissues that get damaged or replacing wear and tear in tissues. And these processes, as I've already said, like when you cut your finger or you bruise your shin or you have an operation and you get a scar, uh, but otherwise you're okay. These, are, these happen all the time and they're beautifully crafted pieces of biology. And they involve the coordinated functions of billions of cells, I mean, we're talking huge numbers of cells, the individual components of which our bodies are made, all in this beautiful orchestrated dance that starts 
and most importantly, at, at some point when the wound is resolved, stop. And cancers, as I've said, are hijacked versions of these same processes. And the reason they don't stop is that these processes are not driven by signals. So normally, you cut your finger, um, some blood leaks out, it clots. And the reason it clots is that you've got these things called platelets that drive the clotting program. And as the platelets break open and drive the clotting program, they release growth factors. And these growth factors then make the cells in the local area, but only in the local area, then proliferate, seal up the gap. And once that's happened, there are no more platelets, there's no more growth factors, and the system turns off. So it's important that you switch the machine on and you switch the machine off. So normally, these programs are driven by these signals. And when the signals disappear, the program shuts down. That's how it works all day, every day. What we understand now in cancer, and we didn't really, didn't really know this until about 20 years ago uh, in any of the detail that we know now and certainty that we know now, is that the machinery that, that um, transduces these signals, so these signals hang around outside the cell. They're picked up by special molecular recognition systems called receptors, which uh, the cell is bounded by a membrane, which keeps the inside of the cell away from the outside. And these transmembrane receptors, which have a very specific recognition, the biology is all about shapes touching one another and, and fitting into one another or inducing a fit into one another, essentially handshaking with each other. So the signal binds the outside of this receptor. And these receptors then cross the membrane and on the inside, they have an effector, which then says, up, oh, bound something, and they fire a signal. And then the signal gets relayed down a variety of different machines. And it's all about information. And unlike a telephone where you know, it gets relayed you know, um, from, from box to box to box, these signals are not linear. And the reason they're not linear, well, the reason, that they, when I say reason, this sort of evolutionary explanation why they're not linear is, um, <laughs> They have to do many, many different things. They have to be able to receive signals to start, to stop, to divide, to differentiate. And essentially, they're all using the same general pieces of machinery, which are deployed in different combinations. All right, so it's more like an internet than it is like a telephone system. So signals route round all over the place. They move and they do this, and some, they, sometimes they do that, and they activate things that in that cell they still activate, but they don't do anything in that cell because those same things get activated in another cell where they do do things. So there's no, uh, there's no system that's cleaning it all up and making sure only the right things happen in each cell. There's an awful lot of stuff that is just generic. Okay, so it's, um, it's, I'm trying to think of an, uh, uh, of an analogy, and it's very, very difficult. But basically, you've got these generalized machines, and the whole process gets activated, and then the information at the bottom is sifted out depending on what the cell is about to do and what the context is. So the reason I'm spending a little bit of time on this is to explain to you that um, though we understand what these machines are that convey information, the way the information is conveyed is still something of a mystery to us. But what we do know is that in cancers, the machines that convey the information normally take an input, undergo a change, and then send an output. And cancers are when those machines are mutated and they now send an output even though there's no input. That's the bottom line. So the reason that they don't stop when the injury is resolved, if you like, is because they're driven by mutations. And these mutations are inherited from the parent cell to the daughter cells to the daughter cells to the daughter cells. Now, cancers are common. Um, one in three people, maybe one in two people, as people, um, as, as, as lifespan uh, begins, uh, begins to increase, we're seeing more and more cancers. Cancers um, reach a peak in, in young adults of certain types of cancers, as you well know. Um, and then the majority of cancers occur later on in life. Um, they're all caused by these mutations in various of these molecular machines. And we know that the mutations are arising millions of times a day. And the reason that I say that is that your body contains about 100,000 billion cells. So it's 10 with 14 zeros behind it. So just to give you some idea about how big that number is, and that is a really big number, it's the number of stars in 1,000 Milky Ways. OK, that's a lot of cells. And one of those cells gets a mutation 
that drives it to proliferate uncontrollably, and in principle, that cell will divide and divide and divide, and you have cancer. So once out of 100,000 billion, um, it's amazing that cancers are as rare as they are. Okay. So what drove me and what's driven my entire attempt to try and understand cancer is to understand the bizarre rarity of the cancer cell because cancers, cancer cells are cells doing what normal cells do all day, every day. The only difference is they can't turn that process off. So what we're dealing with in cancer, we're dealing with not new biology. This is not some strange, ghastly, medieval you know, thing that's growing or anything. It's, it's a perfectly normal process. It's just not being regulated properly. All right? And it's a process that we've evolved in order to keep our bodies going and keep them to going to reproductive even to repair them and, and deal with infection and injury and running away from saber-toothed tigers and you know, all this sort of stuff that, 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 that um, early humans had to do when they, they had no technology. So the question that I'm often asked is, yeah, but who gets it and who doesn't get it? And the answer is, it's a lottery. And it's no one's to blame. You can't pin it down on anything. Yeah, there are things you can do that increase the chances of getting cancer. Smoking, for example, would be the most obvious one. It's the single greatest self-inflicted risk um, of cancer incidence. On the other hand, um, as my grandmother said to me on many occasions, your grandfather uh, survived two world wars and smoked a pipe. He actually inhaled from a pipe. And he lived till he was 94, to which my reply is, ah, yes, but he survived two world wars. That doesn't mean to say that nobody died in a world war. It just meant he was lucky. Okay. So luck plays a great part in this. And I think, by and large, luck, ill, or whatever luck you want to call it, is the single biggest determinant. The real issue is not who gets cancer and who doesn't get cancer. The real issue is what do we as human beings, what is we as human beings going to do about it? And, you know, there's lots of great things about being a human being, to go to parties and wonderful meetings like this and everything else. <laughs> but the most remarkable thing about human beings is that we can, when we put our minds to it, do the most incredible things. We really can. And I don't just mean going to the moon. In the last 10 years, with the increased depth of knowledge that we have of the actual molecules that get broken that cause cancers, different types of cancers. We now understand that these molecules, when they get broken, are what are called oncogenic drivers. Oncogenesis meaning cancer, start of cancer, growth of cancer. And these things drive the process. And one of the understandings that we've had is that the processes that drive cancers at their initiation remain required for driving those cancers thereafter. Now, Gesundheit. Now, um, is, this, is this a surprise? Well, it's not really a surprise. If you think of these things as an accelerator or gas pedal, okay, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. So, you know, essentially, you know, our cells are built rather like cars um, insofar as the signals to make them go have to be applied to make the car go. And the other thing that's interesting about a gas pedal, I'm leaving aside cruise control here, so you know, most of us in Britain don't, well, you can't drive fast enough to have cruise control in Britain. <laughs> but the, there's a feature of the accelerator pedal, which is, of course, incredibly important, which is when you take your foot off it, it doesn't stay down. It comes back up again. So the default is to stop. And that is the default in the cells in our body. And it's very good analogy that the gas pedal, accelerator pedal, gets stuck down due to a mutation in your foot. And that is what causes uncontrollable driving of the cancer. Now, there are certain things that might happen early on in cancer that allow the cancer to break through a window as it's evolving and developing into a disease. And then after that, you don't need it. And we know that there are some mutations which are involved in the initiation of cancer, but they're not actually required to maintain the cancer thereafter. And so they're not therapeutic targets. They might be preventative targets, 
okay, but they're not therapeutic targets because they're not involved in the actual disease. They were involved in the disease arising in the first place. Um, some people are very interested in those because they think one way of, of, of trying to um, uh, prevent the scourge of cancer is to prevent cancers from arising uh, de novo from the start. And that's absolutely right. The problem is that there's a practical problem there, which is developing drugs which treat healthy people in case they might get cancer is very much harder than developing drugs that treat people with the disease. Because what you've got to do, you've got to show that there's actually going to be no deleterious effect whatsoever on the patient. And these drugs will presumably have to be taken throughout the entire patient's life. So you can imagine, though, this is a really lovely idea, it's uh, practically uh, difficult. And sometimes there is a criticism of, of cancer research, which is there's not enough attention paid to prevention, and I think that's absolutely true. But there are, you know, these sort of practical problems with trying to develop um, pharmacological agents or practices um, which might inflict some other sort of harm. And the reason you can see that now, I hope, is that if cancers are just derailed versions of normal processes of injury, repair, and everything else, then it's quite likely that if you block cancers, you will incapacitate some degree of the ability of a patient to repair normal injuries. And that could have all sorts of negative effects, so certainly cumulatively over, over uh, life. It might uh, decrease lifespan, and people might die of something else other than cancer, uh, and so on and so forth. So what we now know is that there is this whole group of mutations in cancers and the ability to sequence the entire human genome relatively cheaply. That's, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, we have a, a software code, a disk drive inside every cell. It's a long, thin molecule called DNA. It's actually not that big. It's only three gigabits. I mean, it's like, oh, hello, my iPhone's already. You know, so. um, OK. But of course, it doesn't run the programs. It just sets the programs up. The programs run with the machinery in your cells. So it's an instruction set. That's also, this is the general principle by which this happens. But the actual process of building all the tissues and everything else is not done by the code. It's done by what the code makes the machines do. So I want that to be very, very clear. And the code gets corrupted in cancer because that's what a mutation is, the DNA code. And we can now sequence through the whole code. Now, one of the problems is that I, I, I said earlier, mutations are occurring all of the time. Um, in fact, DNA is not a very sensible molecule to build your genetic code out of. You'd like a molecule that really was like, I don't know, rock. So, you know, if, if I were designing life, I'd build it out of silicon. <laughs> but actually, it's built out of this carbohydrate, a polysaccharide molecule, which is very easily damaged. And because of that, your cells spend probably about 10% of their time and energy and their genes just curating the DNA and nurturing it and tidying it up and because it, it, things are falling off it all the time. Believe me, it's, it's hell down there, right? And, and uh, preening it, polishing it, all this sort of stuff and making sure it's okay. And then if it's not okay and, the, and, and it's clearly not okay, uh, then signaling that that cell with its damaged DNA dies. So we know that um, one of the uh, commonest outcomes of cells that get damaged DNA with serious damage is they commit suicide. Because every cell in your body has a suicide program. And we know that that suicide program is very important in preventing cancer because that's one of the ways it works. You, you know, something ha damages one of these machines that moves information around. And if the damage is, is sensed, then the cell in some way that we still don't quite understand. We, we, we understand how it works. We don't know why it makes the decision to do this and the other, commit suicide. Because a cell with damaged DNA is more risk to you than a cell with damaged DNA that still survives. Well, uh, sorry, a cell that with damaged DNA that survives is much more risk to you than the cell with damaged DNA that's removed. And the reason for that is if you lose you know, a million cells from your liver, it doesn't matter, you can make more. But if you have one cell in your liver that can't stop dividing, it might kill you because you now have potentially cancer. So we have these remarkably sophisticated mechanisms to sense when damage occurs and to somehow tell the difference between when these signals are being driven normally by, by signals from outside in response to injury and when they're driven abnormally by mutation. And these mechanisms are called tumor suppressors. 
And we know that if we don't have tumor suppressors, for example, you can make mice without these tumor suppressors. These are molecules that monitor what's going on. And when I say <laughs> monitor what's going on, it sounds cool, but, but they're not looking around going, hmm. They're just lumps, they're proteins. So there's nothing inside a cell that's thinking about anything. It's all basically a robot. And yet these robots are able to distinguish when they are being driven normally and when they're driven abnormally. And how that works is still one of the great outstanding mysteries of cancer biology. What the difference is between normal and abnormal and how a system knows when it's abnormal and when it's normal. But anyway, you have these tumor suppressors and we know if we knock them out in a mouse, for example, all the mice die of cancer within a few weeks of being born. So we know that these tumor suppressors are another part of the mechanisms that sense what's going wrong in the cell. And if something goes wrong, they normally stop the cell dead in its tracks or they trigger it to commit suicide using an innate suicide program. So we're heavily defended against this disease. And that means that it's not that you're unlucky to get cancer um, because most people, that cancers never start. What it means is everybody's getting proto-cancers all of the time, and they then get censored out and screened out by active sensing and machinery within your cells. And that's why it's a numbers game, because that machinery isn't 100% accurate, because no machinery can be 100% accurate. And the problem is that when it fails, and it fails very, very rarely, but unfortunately it does fail, uh, that particular person uh, can come down with a malignant disease. Now, the other thing about cancer is it's not a thing. It's sort of like a species, um, in that cancers contain many cells, and these cells then begin to diversify, because actually all cells in your body diversify. They've all got different mutations from each other. It just doesn't make any difference, because the, the mutations are usually in bits of DNA that don't do anything. But as cancers divide, they diversify genetically. And that means that they change and they morph and any cancer cell in that population that picks up something that gives it a slight growth advantage will now begin to grow out. And so what happens is it's, it's rather like life on Earth. You see life forms diversifying. Originally there was you know, one type of shark-like fish and then it diversified into many different shark-like fish. And it's the same process because cancer is driven by the same process that drives life in the world, which is evolution. And evolution is something that is sometimes hard to get your head around because it looks like evolution is moving in a particular direction. You know, we, we start as bacteria and we end up as human beings who have parties. <laughs> but that's not how it works. In fact, it's drifting all over the place, branching out. It's not got a direction. It's change. And then the only arbiter is whether the organism that comes from the latest change is able to compete and survive and reach reproductive age and then pass its genes on. So, you know, you often, in fact, my initial interest in dinosaurs was because they were obviously a sort of outmoded, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, outmoded form of life that was no longer fashionable. And they died in deference to the furry mammals. Okay. <laughs> Actually, what happened, we think, is a thumping great asteroid collided with the Earth and wiped out almost everything it just wiped out more dinosaurs than it did furry mammals. And 60 million years later, we're going, hey, asteroids, cool, we love them. Actually, asteroids are really bad for human <laughs> beings as well. Um, but uh, 60 million years ago is a long time, and we only see the survivors. And when we see cancers, we see the cancers that progress. And so we have this sense, which is often portrayed to people, that there's some sort of entity in there that's planning a malign strategy to try and make your life a misery. And it isn't like that at all. This is a blind process. And you need to, I think, understand that um, because there's no war going on between you and it. There's a battle in terms of you and how you deal with your disease and everything else like that. But there's not a lot that can be done by sheer willpower. At least we don't think so. If there were, and if it turned out that somebody through yoga and everything else found some way to control cancer cells, I'd be the happiest person on the planet. Of course, I'd reserve the right to understand how it worked. <laughs> so I don't want to exclude anything and anything that, uh, that works for individuals. But certainly from my point of view, the molecular point of view, we understand it now 
as a relentless process that would have to happen at some point, at some time. And you can do the calculation that if human beings didn't die of anything else, by the time they reached the age of 120, they would all get cancer. Okay. So this is an inevitability, and it's something that we want to control. So how are we going to control it? So in the last 10 years, this explosion in our understanding of what actually goes wrong in cancers has revealed to us how these machines that move information around that drive cancer cells become defective. And uh, a lot of them are just switches. They're switches that take um, go information and then convey it to downstream targets within the cell. And it turns out that they uh, do this by uh, changing their shape and then communicating with other proteins, which then convey the information. It's like a sort of domino effect. And that we can now make drugs that stop a lot of those defective proteins in their tracks. And it's not true of every cancer, because cancers are quite diverse. Some cancers are much more difficult to treat than other cancers. Um, in Cancer Research UK, for example, they've defined in adult cancers the major cancers of unmet mead to be a certain type of brain cancer, lung cancer, and pancreatic cancer. They're not the only cancers that kill people, of course, but they're the ones where we really don't have very much to uh, treat patients with. Um, at least, we don't have smart therapies to treat patients with. We just have these old-fashioned therapies, which we know are um, you know, ra rather difficult treatments to administer to patients because they do quite a lot of damage or can do quite a lot of damage. What's happening now is we're developing drugs that don't really do any damage except to the cancer cells. And the results initially are very, very remarkable and striking in that cancers large tumors, cancers, metastases shrink away to almost nothing. The problem is that we've now imposed this selective pressure on the cancers, and any variants that are resistant to the drug now start to grow back. So it doesn't mean to say the drugs stop working. The drug's still doing something. It's just instead of trying to target tigers, you're now trying to target the elephants that came up from the tigers. But what's really exciting is that it turns out if we look at the ways in which these cancers become resistant to these targeted drugs, it's not a free-for-all. They're stuck in ruts. They can only do it in a limited number of ways. And already you're seeing, for example, in the disease lung cancer, that first therapies have failed because the, the cancer has evolved to be resistant to the first drug. And there have now second um, drugs made which specifically target the mutant forms of that tar initial target. And the mutation is how it became resistant to the first drug. And then you can hit again, and you can hit again, and you can hit again. And what happens is you can eventually, we think, knock cancers into a sort of cul-de-sac where they can't evolve out of the therapies that you've built around them. And my prediction will be that we will begin to see this uh, taking big effect. It's already started, as I said, with lung cancer. And we will begin to see you know, huge effects on uh, many of the commoner types of, of cancer uh, over the next 10 years. Now, it takes a long time. And it takes a long time because you're mucking around with the very machinery that keeps tissues going and keeps them together. So. Obviously, making drugs that interferes with that process is something you have to be very, very careful about because you don't want to... Nobody, and what, nobody wants to give drugs to anybody who make them unhappy and miserable and do damage to them. But the signs are all good. The last 10 years have broken what I think is 40 years of banging my head against a brick wall trying to understand something that seemed irreducibly complex. And instead, the message is, I think, now should be one of optimism. There will be patients who we won't be able to treat. It's a piecemeal solution. Um, and it will evolve and get better over the next two, three, four decades. Uh, some cancers already, which were, you know, um, essentially you didn't survive longer than a few months, um, are now treatable, at least to the point where patients um, can, can go into remission for up to a decade. Now, you might think, well, we've not cured it, but you know, the rate at which new drugs are being generated now, the, 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 the landscape looks totally different within a decade, within five years. 
So there were new ways of treating um, a lot of patients who um, basically relapse if they do relapse sometime later. So what I'd say to you is um, there's hope. Be hopeful. Um, we're working as hard as we possibly can to try and find out how best to treat everybody's cancer. Um, I can't say be patient, because a lot of you don't want to be patient, or you won't be patient, OK? Um, and you are patients, a lot of you. Sorry, that's a very, very bad pun. And I, I do apologize. It's the sort of thing my daughter would yell at me for. You know, Dad, come on, you didn't say that, did you? Um, but I would like to tell you that we're doing our damnedest, and the, the world will be, at some point in the future, a much brighter place. And thank you for listening to me. Um, do you have a seat? Is it okay if we take a couple questions? Oh, oh no. um, we just we have we're coming to the end. Um, but I know we have, we have time for a couple of questions. Does anyone have any questions, Precious? You thought? Do you want to have a seat? Oh no, I'll stand. No, up, you're still okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to sit down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, and thank you. Um, my Hi. question is: Where do you stand on alternative therapies, and can you? kindly explain the impact of cannabis on, yes. <laughs> on cancer. There's so much information about cannabis curing cancer, yeah. and can you say something about it? Can, can, can we smoke a joint and it. make it go away, or <laughs> what can we do? Well, I lived in the Bay Area for a long time, so <laughs> cannabis is actually, you know, was grown in the field next door, I think. <laughs> Look, um, I, I don't know about uh, alternative therapies. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to talk about them. But if I think about it mechanically in terms of what we know is going on in cancer, we know that different cancers are different. And it's, it's almost impossible to think that there could be generalized cures for the disease because that's not what's going on. We do ourselves a, a disservice by calling it cancer as though it's a thing. It's not. It's a whole series of dysfunctions within the regenerative machinery of our cells. Different tissues regenerate differently. Think about it, your tissues are all different from one another. And when you wound them, different programs rebuild them because they're all different. They have different structures, architectures, functions, different risk of infection, different risk of cancer. Uh, you know, the superficial epithelium are bombarded with all these cancer-inducing chemicals. So the point is that the cancers are all very diverse and different. And so it's difficult to imagine how one-size-fits-all therapy could ever work. Having said that, if I'm proved wrong tomorrow, I'm a scientist. I go, yippee, yippee twice. First, we've got a therapy. And second, I've got something to study and work out how it works. <laughs> I, I, I don't have a strong feeling against it. I just don't see how it would work at the moment. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I see where this one's going. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's just that in, in the States, there are licensed medical uh, clinics that are li and, and oncologists and cancer yeah. centers actually refer patients to have cannabis oil therapy. Um, mm -hmm. So if that's licensed in the States and they're more sort of proactive, yeah. I'm just thinking that serious medical professionals can see the benefit and are... Well, I personally can't see any reason whatsoever to make cannabis illegal. I never have done. Uh, never touched it myself, uh, but mainly that's because I've only got one asset, and that's what's going on up here. And then I muck around with it, you know, I'm not tall, for example. You know, yeah. um, uh, I think it depends what you're going to use it for. If you're going to use it for a relief of nausea, uh, anxiety, pain, absolutely. I think there's quite good evidence that it works. If, on the other hand, you're going to say it's actually an anti-cancer agent, like, you know, the, everyone's got an extract of some tree or something that, if it weren't for people like me who are involved in some vast international conspiracy to suppress the fact that we can cure cancer. Oh, yeah, really. You know how difficult it is to keep an international conspiracy going every, every day? Well, you know, by, oh, God, not again. Oh, again, I mustn't tell my dog anything. You know, it's like that. Um, you know it doesn't work like that. Um, so, you know, absolutely. Uh, I, but I'm very relaxed about that. You know, really, it's what makes you feel better. And I don't think anybody should get between you and what makes you feel better. Nobody. It's your body. It's your right to treat you uh, whatever way you can. 
Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, you know, I've seen some of the evidence. It's, yeah, it's, and there's no mechanism there. So, you know, I, I, but all I would say is I'm no expert on the pharmacology of cannabis. And most of the receptors for cannabis are in the brain. So mm. I'm not entirely sure how it was supposed to work in epithelial tissues or solid tissues. Yeah. Okay. I'm very boring. See, I'm a scientist. So, <laughs> so the bottom line is it always tries to come back in my head to mechanism. Yeah. I'll accept anything uh, on the basis of a suggestion. But, you know, if I can't see how it's working, and I have to be careful because obviously we don't understand everything about it. So there may be things that work in a way that I, I don't understand. They're, they're, they're almost, well, maybe there almost certainly are. But what we know of cancer so far, it doesn't seem to fit into our mechanistic understanding. Uh, but if I'm proved wrong, that's fine. By me. Yeah. We've got two more two questions, yeah. which we already have. Thanks, so Sorry if you haven't had a chance to ask yeah, the question, okay. but we will... Um, yeah. Hiya. Um, Hi. Obviously, there's over 200 cancers that you need to... So when people say, we've got a cure for cancer, obviously, you've got a cure individually each 200. But if you have rare cancers like osteosarcoma, yeah. where um, survival rates haven't changed for 25 years and things like pancreatic cancer for 40 years, if your cancer's rare, are we going to be like on the back foot because we've got a smaller sample, if that makes sense? You know, like if you've got a bigger sample for breast cancer, it'd be logic that you'd spend more money. But the rarer ones, obviously, we hardly get any funding. So yeah. are we saying we're going to be years behind? So I'm going to... Sorry. I, I'm going to speak out of turn here. I mean, you know, I, I owe it to you to be indiscreet, okay, and be as honest as I can. Um, it's not always, you know, the, the thing that makes certain cancers, um, that, that puts a lot of money into research in certain cancers, breast cancer would be a very good example, were because women got fed up with suffering from this disease and they raised the public awareness of it. It's less common than prostate cancer in man, for example, um, but nonetheless it strikes at an earlier age and they've been very, very good. Uh, and quite rightly, at, at developing you know, lots of um, charities and putting a lot of money into breast cancer research. And it's, it's a common cancer, but it's no more common than colorectal cancer and so on and so forth. So what cancers attract, what money, is not always just how big a problem they are or how many patients suffer from them. But there's something else going on, which is often these less common types of cancer or downright uncommon types of cancer can often end up as being more therapeutically tractable than the more common types of cancer, because they, the common types of cancer come in so many guises, where these unusual tumors, particularly tumors in young people, tend to be due to much, much more focal um, mutations that arise in particular types of cell. And so, paradoxically, if people, and, and it's not true anymore that nobody's, it, it's not true ever that nobody's working on them, but you're absolutely right. The people who work on them work on them either because they're committed to that particular type of disease. It's just sad that they're like 25 years behind, you know, survival rates. It's just sad that how long yeah. to catch up, you know, it's going to take a yeah. long time. Whether, no, it won't. Whether, yeah, but I yeah. mean, it's still going to take time, but yes. 25 years is quite a long time. And some, yes. you know, some childhood cancers, not just my, my yeah. own, don't get, you know, a lot of funding into them. Whether, for whatever reason, yeah. but it's just sad that some of... Far yeah. All I'm saying is, and I, I, I yeah, absolutely, I, I completely agree with you. All I'm saying is that sometimes um, things open up in, in certain types of cancer. <coughs> Childhood leukemia would be a very good example, where it turns out the um, the cure rates are now very, very good, and that's because of the peculiarities of that very unusual disease. It's not like other um, solid cancer, it's not like solid cancers, which come in many different forms and guises, and therefore are much more difficult to treat. Um, in terms of getting people to focus on them and everything else, absolutely, we need to do that. Uh, there's only so many people involved in cancer research. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, 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 but no, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah.